That is also true. Yeah. You should get cornrows. Do cornrows for nationals. I will do cornrows for nationals. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Welcome to Practical Shooting After Dark. My name is Ben. Uh, I'm here with the boys. We're going to talk about shooting on deck tonight. Um, from the south part of the country where it's really hot is Mr. Tyler. Cool intro here. Cool intro here. And from the middle part of the country where it's also kind of hot and unpleasant, Mr. GMJP. Hello, everyone. Oh, man. You guys know the rules. You guys come here with topics, things to talk about, things that people find interesting. In this age of uh, major match drama, cheating scandals, all that horse shit, um, maybe we'll talk about uh, some interesting stuff. So, who'd like to go first? Tyler. Tyler would like to go first. I can do that. Tyler, I understand you want to talk about... I forgot already. I want to talk about life memberships. I have one of those. I know you do, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about that. I figured you'd probably be the only one on the panel with a life membership. Um, I was just, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. What, uh, I guess my topic is really just asking you questions. Oh, <laughs> but, shit, uh, okay. Fair enough. Uh, what, so what do you get from a life membership other than never having to pay annual dues again? Like, is there something special about it? As near as I could tell? No, I don't think you get shit. I just think you are a member for life. You don't get like 10 votes in elections and stuff? I don't think so. I mean, not to my knowledge. That would be cool. So I was, from what I can tell, the only benefit to a life membership, other than not having to pay annual dues, is you have to be a life member uh, to serve as area director, president, and director of NROI. You think that's okay. so? Is it you think it's like a barrier to entry or like proof that someone has skin in the game enough to serve those roles? You think that <laughs> is part of the function? I guess. I mean, I, I didn't write the bylaws, but I would assume so that that's what that's what that's for. It also avoids the problem of having a one of those people in those positions accidentally not become not be a member. So right. if they're an annual member and they don't pay their dues or something and then they're not a member, then that would maybe make for an interesting situation. So you avoid that. Well, what do you think? Are there any special privileges or um, things that you think you should get out of a life membership? What in other that words? I think what, you should get. Like, yeah. What What should the organization do, if anything, to uh, create an incentive or an additional benefit to being a life member? And what I'm is not, it? Is it? 500? I'm not sure if it's good for them. I'm not sure if it's good for them to have life members or bad. I don't really know how the money part works out. Just think about. It. So it's 500 bucks, right? Yeah. And it's 35 a year. Well, it's like it changes depending on how many you get at a time. If you do the three a year, right? It's 25, yeah. right? I, don't I think it's 25 a year for the basic and what 40 if you get the magazine is that right that that sounds right to me i don't so know so if you got just the basic membership how many it, how many more years is the magazine going to be going though i don't I'm know honest. print is dead everywhere else dude that magazine well maybe this maybe this is a side tangent i was going to make this as a topic for me one time but like man I, it's not just me. I'm not. It's not just that I'm a crusty old fuck. But there's there's a lot of people who are just like so disinterested in the magazine at this point. I, I mean, don't even bother to flip through yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I look at the cover and there's somebody shooting like rimfire or something, and I'm like, oh, I mean, it's not that that's good or bad. It's like I don't really care about that. And I flip through there, and it's like there's a review of 22 ammunition, and flip through some more. It's like, oh, this is like why Virginia counts awesome or whatever, like flip through some more. I'm like, I don't fuck, I don't care about any of this shit. And that's just kind of what it's become, that there's just not that much stuff in there. That's interesting. So I, I, I wouldn't complain if they killed it, honestly. Yeah. Well, is it, is it a net, um, income earner from ads? I wonder. Um, I don't know. I really don't. It's hard to say. I mean, it depends on how, I don't know how they make it, but 
Um, my impression is that there's some paid employees putting it together, but a lot of the content is coming free from other people, or maybe they get paid a little bit. Right. I don't know. Um, but then they get the content more or less on the cheap and then just kind of lay it out and put it out there. I imagine it makes money because I think the ads are super expensive. Like the ads are obnoxiously expensive to me. They don't make sense what they cost. As far so, as last last I discussed pricing with them anyway. Yeah. So, so I just Googled it because I always just pay three years. Like I don't I don't pay any attention. I'm just going to pay it. If it was 500 bucks, if it was $25 a year, that's 20 years that you have to shoot USPSA to make it worth your money. And I'm, a, I'm cheap, so of course I would figure this out. But you have to shoot USPSA for 20 years to break even, which is quite a bit. Well, maybe not. I mean, prices they I mean prices would increase over time for the membership dues, I would imagine. Yeah, that could yeah. be fair. Yeah, so you're you're um, locking in the price. That's that's a good way to look at it. But you're paying in today's dollars, which will be worth less as time goes on. So, inflation, cost of yes. living, of course. Yeah. So Tyler, what got you on the life member uh, topic? I don't know. What, what is of interest to you? Well, I was just wondering, you know, I don't have one. You have one. Why? Like Mine what, was, what, mine what was a you? gift. Okay. I, okay. So uh, okay. Pro Shop Tim, uh, I think I bought him an Xbox to play games with me. So I mailed him an Xbox one year. And I was like, on the condition that you play games with me. And then I think he uh, he got me a USPSA Life membership because he was he felt shame and guilt that I was such a good friend and he was so terrible and didn't get me anything. As I recall, that's how that worked. I wonder if Tim would say the same story. I think he probably would. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that fucker got me an Xbox, so I had to do something. It'd be the same. Imagine if uh, imagine if somebody like bought you a car. Joel and like trailed it to your house and dumped it for you. Just imagine you'd feel obligated. You being so nice, you'd feel mm -hmm. obligated to do something for that person. Yeah, probably would be. That's correct. Yeah, see? Tim's got that same disease. Well, that's just the right thing to do, my man. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, what the incentives are other than if you had an aspiration to be a uh, one of the officers or, or an area director or something like that in the organization. And, um, you know, what the, what the organization might do to make that appealing or make it sort of special, because if it's, if it's the same, whether or not you pay your 25 a year for 20 years or pay your 500 and you're now a life member. I think some people like the idea of having an L membership. That lasts in perpetuity. The good thing for the organization is they now have a paid member that lasts uh, for as long as that person's alive. Mm -hmm. So it's good for the membership to numbers because they'd be like, yep, that person's a member. Even if they're not really active anymore, it wouldn't. I mean, they'd be like, yeah, OK, we have a we have a yeah. life member. Well, I was thinking, you know, for a while, the big thing from the organization was uh, committees. You remember that? A big push for committees in which um, members would be, uh, or regular members would be on the committee. That was Foley's thing, I think, when he got elected, right? Yeah, and it it lasted about, it kind of petered out over time. But I was thinking, you know, if you had, um, if that was a requirement for committee membership and they actually maintained standing committees where you had at-large members to provide, um, I don't know, council or input advice to the board something like that i'm just trying to brainstorm ways that life membership will be something special as opposed to just a normal membership i think the different membership number is probably probably a big incentive for people as weird as that sounds yeah um because then other people see that you're a life member and then they just don't have to worry about re-upping their membership ever again well it's just a status symbol yeah yeah. That's what I think. That's my that's my feeling. Well, interesting, Tyler. I like how he's like, I want to talk about life membership. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, well, Joel. Yeah, maybe that's something they should look at to make it more 
appealing I, for people. I don't know if it's necessarily good for the organization to sell a lot of life memberships. Because if they're if people you just keep them hooked annually. No, nah, you know what? I bet you on on average, if the people buy a life membership, it works out for the organization. I bet you feel more obligated to uh, to participate in the sport. You're like, well, I bought this life membership. Whereas if you had a, a a one year member, you'd be like, hey, maybe I'm done for a while. It's like, well, I already paid the money. I better I better keep doing this. You know, keep going to matches, and then they'd get more activity fees. I suppose so. I wonder. It'd be fun to see the numbers on how the average number of years people actually stick around with the sport seems like there's there has to be some trends as far as you know people give it you know six seven eight year there are outliers both directions you may shoot a, a year and stop or you may shoot it the better part of your life 30 plus years but it seems to me like there would probably be some kind of average amount of time spent in the sport actively yeah, that, is, that would be i would be very curious to see that personality would play into that though because like the heavy hitters like the tylers are, do you think you'll be doing usbsa when you're 60 years old and you're just going there to have fun you're, you're not competitive anymore but you're just there to have fun and hang out with your friends would that be you well speak for yourself i'm gonna i'm gonna be on the super senior world shoot you're gonna team. be on the super senior <laughs> squad when you're 60 <laughs> yeah, some people might be there for the duration just because they like hanging out with their friends, and some people are like, hey, I, I can't be competitive anymore. I can't get better no matter how much I train. I'm falling apart. Time to peace out. Yeah. 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 Well, so there's no secret, you know, forum. You don't get the keys to the special life member bathroom or anything. Then. No. To I really didn't know. As far as I as far as I can tell, I didn't really get anything. I just got a different member number. Okay. It's been transparent to me, uh, Mr. Joel. All right. Uh, this weekend shooting. Oh. I shot the Iowa section match. Tell so, me more. I don't know. It's probably my favorite match of the year, uh, because the matches run so well, and there are a few things that I think are very noteworthy. So one of the main things that sticks out in my mind is their staff is all local shooters, and they have a really good culture. Um, I mentioned to MD how nice everyone is there, and he said being friendly is one of the things that he mentions in their morning RO meeting. So think back to how many matches you've been to where some guy with a timer has this look, like he just can't wait for you to get done uh, so he can go home. You know? It's a hot afternoon. Their staff actually makes you feel welcome, which I don't well, know. He and I probably have the same look on our face, though. <laughs> That's true. Uh, they have a balanced test of skills for the stages. So they have short, medium, long courses, one-handed shootings, uh, low port, close shooting, some far away shooting, partials, all that stuff. So the stages don't feel the same, which the variety is really important to me. That is definitely a reason to keep me coming back. Uh, they sync up the results hourly or maybe every few hours, so you can track results throughout the day. So I knew oh, the I score. Thought. I knew the score anytime I wanted to know the score. And every time that I refreshed the, the competitor app, there were updates, which was awesome. Um, they had ice bottled water on the base. I know that's kind of expected, but there still is some matches that don't do that. So, and they had catered lunch was provided. That was just part of your part of your tuition, which was cool. Your match fee. So, um, if all that wasn't enough, they had air conditioned restrooms this year. Um, apparently, they were donated, and I'm told they're quite expensive. So that might not be happening next year in the future wait, wait, was, air conditioned cool. like porta potties yes i should have posted a picture online that's intense man yeah so uh it was just like this like a looked like a trailer i guess almost mm -hmm. but yeah like with the men's and women's side that's air conditioned inside and running water and all that stuff so they, yeah, they had some awesome. of those uh at the north carolina section a few years ago and those were very nice From what i told they're like 500 bucks a day um, i'm sure they're rent. crazy crazy expensive yeah but anyway, that was really cool they had that there, as if the match wasn't already good enough. So um, I just think they're an excellent example of how matches should be run. Uh, their staff's all rowing in the same direction, and they communicate well, which is a big deal. So I had a good time. I, I plan to make that match every year. There's no reason that will ever change. But you they are, just do. You are but, always slobbing that match's knob, man. I like it. I every like time it, it comes up. So, Iowa section is so good. <laughs> Well, it stands out in my mind compared to going somewhere where the stages are all the same, 
or maybe I... Well, why don't you name those matches, Joel? Exactly. It's already relentless positivity. Let's shit on some stuff. Well, if I... What was if your, I... What's your least favorite match on your schedule, Joel? I don't need to share it. What if I just said, <laughs> if I I'm go... I'm just this? kidding. I'm fucking with you. You, you know I'm not going to drop that anyway. If I go to a match <laughs> and it's not fair or consistent, like, there's red flags, you know? Oh. That's that. Super, so, yeah. It's super annoyed. Well, the, uh, no, the, the, the nail in the coffin is when you're talking to match staff. I mean, usually it's like the higher, higher ups and you're like, Hey, like this thing over here is like fucked up. And then they just like, they don't care. And you're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I don't need to be here. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> had that the, conversation. The attitude yeah. or, or the culture, like you're talking about, it really does start at the top with the MD and the RM. Like if they're, if they communicate, to their people like how they want their customers treated and that's another thing like if they actually see shooters as their customers i think it makes a big difference i hope they see them as more than customers yeah but in a way that you want uh you want to put on you want pe you want to give people value for their money mm -hmm. obviously because it's a competition it's more than that it's more than a commodity it's a competition yeah. But it's, it's a competition that needs to be fair, and people are there not for money, but because they're passionate about it, and you know right. that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, but like like their MD there, like we'll drop names like Scott. He says it's a competitor's match. He he runs the match the way he would want to, you know, a match he would be going to. Well, they the thing that I like about Scott is he's actually I've shot the match there before, and I yeah. I liked it, Joel. Although um, the days of me being relentlessly enthusiastic are maybe done in my advanced age. Um, <laughs> Uh, I Scott is coming over. Like, hey, what do you think of the stages? And I got the sense like he's he not actually just, cares. Yeah, he's not like wanting me to tell him how good the stages are. And he'll be like, no, no, like specifically. And I'm like, oh, okay, like this and this was cool, and like that other thing. Like I don't know about that, but I mean, I like the idea. But blah blah blah, and give like actual feedback. And m my sense of it is that the match has uh, consistently been improved there. Mm -hmm. Or so like you in, say you you liked this year better than last. Yeah, this was I think my favorite year so far. Like, oh, the, there you go. Um, and then Andrew's the other guy that runs it. It's the same deal. Like he basically says you could choose to go to any match this weekend or not come. Yet he recognizes the fact that people, you know, they take maybe they take time off work or they travel from other states. They get a hotel room. You know, all your time, money, and energy, and they recognize the fact that you chose their match to come to. And so they're. It's not like. They aren't, uh, it's not like, oh, I owe you a favor for putting on this match. It's like, thank you for coming to our match. Yeah, we worked really hard, but I appreciate that you came to this and we want you to have a good time. And I don't yeah. think all matches have that mentality, to put it bluntly. So. <laughs> no, I would say, uh, I would say not. <laughs> yeah. So like the service mentality and then having all their staff rowing in the same direction and all being on board and being on the same page is a huge deal. Yeah. Well, excellent, Joel. Yeah. Shall we move on? Yes. Ben, what would you like to talk about today, sir? I, I had an interesting conversation. Let me put it this way. Another guy who shoots used to shoot production a lot, he now shoots limited only. And he's very, very good. And you might know him, Joel, because he's from your area. I already got it figured out. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So I uh, had a, a really good chat about um, what we learned, because he and I kind of have common experience, of what we learned shooting a lot of limited. He shoots limited, I mean, all the time, but I shoot a little bit. Um, and for both of us coming from, like, hey, diehard production shooter, production's awesome, whatever, then shooting limited. The, the thing that we learned a lot shooting a lot of 40 was the same for both of us. So that was, man... Um, Everything it's everything's aces shooting limited for a production shooter as long as your grip is on point. The grip's got to be perfect. So like the uh, any uh, any ounce of leniency you get from shooting a I'd say you know a heavy mm -hmm. double action gun in production. So shadow twos, ten folios, like those things are pretty tame. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Shooting mm -hmm. nine millimeter, and if your grip's not quite right, that's not a big deal. But shooting limited, it is like game over with those guns shooting 40 caliber uh you really want your grip to be to be perfect and the, the amount of uh, refinement i've done on my grip just shooting shooting hotter ammo it's been it's been really good 
So I'm even thinking, I mean, even to the point I'm thinking next year, if I'm not shooting a lot of limited, I think I won't. But I still will load up a bunch of ammo and train with uh, limited guns just because it, the uh, what it does for my my grip is is excellent. I think. Uh, so I'm guessing you're mainly referencing the second shot because just bringing the gun to the to the, the right point you want to and pressing the trigger that's going to be the same. But is it recoil control or how the sights track, or what's the what's the big difference? Um, well, that's interesting. It's not, it's not really one or the other. It's like, um, it's when you, when you're shooting, it's, you can get the the first shot lined up on a target. Sure. But if, if your support hand's not like clamped onto the gun and you've seen the guns I'm shooting this year where they've got the really thin grips that they mm-hmm. don't fit me quite right, but you have to hang old, on them hard. Yeah. Old, Henning, old Henning's been uh, too, too busy to get me, uh, my, my, uh, cut Henning grips on there anyway. Uh, the, the grips are a little, little small for me. So yeah, everything's, I've got to hang on hard and everything's got to be perfect. And it's even, it even makes it so like, if my grip's not perfect, uh, then I start shooting and the gun starts flying around and it makes me want to like do goofy things with my firing hand too. It makes me like push on the trigger weird or, you know, clamp, clamp that my firing hand in a, in a strange way. So it's like a lot of things get very difficult in a hurry if my grip's not perfect hmm. and i'd actually I'd say my my uh my draw speed is a bit slower as a result of how perfect i want to have the grip yeah i suppose with production you might be shooting four to six shots and then loading the gun when you move anyway so if you yeah you get a chance to your grip yes yeah, so you get a chance to fix it straight away and actually uh i had a really interesting conversation with the training group guy um it's this this comes to mind messaging me he's like hey look at this this open shooter he's moving through he keeps two hand on the gun a lot more than a lot of other people do like what do you you know what about this what do you think about this um and for me the amount of work it takes to get my grip perfect on my limited gun like i get everything locked in there perfect right i might be more inclined to keep two hands on the gun for longer distances of movement as opposed to taking a hand off to run just because if i have my grip perfect like i want to keep it you know what I mean? And I'm not always taking a hand off to reload. Yeah. So, so little things like that, they kind of stick out at me. So I find that quite, I find that quite interesting. Hmm. Are there any downsides? To what? A production guy shooting a lot of limited or at least a lot of 40. Um, I don't know. I, I would say it kind of depends on your mentality. For me, I have no problem uh, switching from, oh, okay, go hard on these targets or like changing my approach on stages. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the scoring system is what I mean. So adjusting to shooting major versus shooting minor, that's not a, that's not an issue for me, but if that is an issue, that's not going to be made better by, by switching between production and limited. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Do you feel your nine millimeter guns kick less? I mean, you don't shoot wimpy ammo by any means, but do you feel that your nines kick any less? Or they like feel like they kick less. Oh man! After I shot limited for a month in June, I, as you know, I picked up my production because I had like five or six days to shoot those before we went to Florida mm-hmm. for the IPSC, like the yeah. World Shoot Qualifier thing. Mm-hmm. Man, those things felt like BB guns. Yeah, you were running hard with those things right off the bat. No, they felt like BB guns to me. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Would you get the same effect if you loaded up a batch of super hot nine, just ran it through your production gun? In my, in my experience, yes. So I mean, I shoot I shoot super hot ammo sometimes for other stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, in in volume, a lot of it. And then when right. I go to shooting, I mean, if I'm shooting a super hot ammo through a Glock, and then I switch to uh, tan folio shooting regular nine millimeter ammo, it's like oh. Feels pretty similar. So yeah. So that's what I had. Anyway, um, the things we learn. So I learned a lot about grip shooting a uh, forty cal, in my opinion. Like it. Yeah. So let's move on to a question. Really enjoy the podcast. A comment and then a question for Matt. 
Matt's not here, but I know the answer to this anyway. Your segment on Shadow 2 maintenance, as well as the comments from Joel and Ben, were great for helping me focus on Shadow 2 specifics. I'm completely comfortable with the extractor, safety switch, and hammer spring tasks. Thank you. Uh, what this guy's referencing here is a video that went up in training group where we got Matt to give us the maintenance guide for Shadow 2s. So that's, that's what he's talking about. Anyway. The question, do you do your own trigger work? Asking for a friend who noticed humpy spots on an otherwise seven pound DA pole. Um, 5,000 rounds again. What are my options? Wait for it to love oil. Apply some 2,500 grit love. Send it somewhere and start with, uh, that starts with C. Sell it and buy a Glock. Um, that, those, those are the questions this guy's asking about what to do for the Shadow Twos. And I already know the answer. You guys ready? Tell me. Matt shoots the trigger stock. He doesn't he doesn't play around with them. If I had shadow twos, I would replace the recoil spring and probably the hammer spring and the grips. And maybe the front sight. I and think that would, that's that would be I it. I think that's the only stuff that Matt plays with. He's not polishing anything. Uh I have I have a few shadow twos and I can't see any reason that I would do anything except for chain springs personally. Uh, I will say also, when you get those triggers too light, they get kind of spongy. You get all like the, the crazy lightest stuff, and then it's almost like it's, I don't know, I guess spongy is the easiest way to say it. Like the reset's not as crisp and as fast as I like. And you get so hung up on a light trigger, and then uh, we would talk about you get into reliability problems and everything else. So, yeah, grip sights, the hammer pin, or the hammer spring, and the, the recoil spring are all I think needs to be done on those guns. And they yeah. run. So. When, I, when I had Shadow 2s, I messed around with polishing one and not polishing the other one that I wanted to use for Ipsic, and no difference at all that I can tell. Yeah, and I I've also I've handled like worked over ones by Cajun and all, and you know I know trigger feel is really personal preference, but I actually thought not to take a dump on Cajun or anyone else, but you son of a bitch. <laughs> But it was almost too crisp. Like it was it, like a super hard wall. Like everything's way too precise for my liking. Like the the one I had, my match gun with a 13 pound hammer spring, recoil spring and sights and grips like you were talking about. I There's not a thing in the world wrong with that trigger. And it will set off anything. No one wants to talk about reliability. They just want to go talk about trigger pull weights. Yeah. Most of the time. Uh, also, when you shoot that gun more, they're going to... I mean, my Tanfo is the same way. Yeah. I pick, like, my practice gun that's had, like, crazy amounts of dry fire and live fire through it, and the triggers get really smoother. And when that happens, then you might want to put a heavier hammer spring in it just to keep it on par with your other guns that don't get as many rounds through it. So... No. I mean, I dude, if you're buying a Shadow 2, the whole point of buying it is... Uh, it's good to go. You don't have to do the trigger job on it. That's what drives me crazy on Facebook groups is they'll get a gun. Most of the time it happens to be Shadow 2s. And their first question, I just left my FFL. Should I send this thing to CZ Custom or Cajun? And it's like, what the fuck? Like, uh, no, you to, to spend another four or 500 bucks on a, what, $1,100 gun mm -hmm. that doesn't even need it. It just needs a, a $10 spring. Well, one thing, I mean, like Ben would know this better than me, I guess, but one thing I think from not messing with guns and just shooting them stock, it, uh, I would say it enhances your shooting ability, or then you get to the point where you're not so dependent on a light trigger. You could pick up anybody's Shadow 2, or pick up a stock 2, right? I've got a Glock 17 in my safe. It's got a three and a half connector, like whatever the, and that's it. It doesn't have the gun stock. And I shoot that gun pretty okay. Um, so I wouldn't want to be super dependent on I need to have a gun with a super light trigger. It's like, yeah. I, I just pick up the gun. It's okay. Just shoot it. Yeah, I mean, hell, my uh, my limited guns are literally factory. And they're super light. I, I've shot your limited <laughs> guns. Yeah, they're, they're it's like, this two feels pounds, almost, whatever they are. almost dangerously light as it is. Like, and it's like why two would or I mess pounds. with this? It's like two or three pounds. Yeah, it's I mean, I'm sure you get that lighter. It's plenty. I can't it's believe fine. that CZ let some of the tactical sports out of the factory with those triggers like they sub, are light right sub two pound triggers out of the box mm, makes me <laughs> that make me yeah. very nervous 
Because you know the kind of guys who are buying these. Well, how dare you? You Whoa. know, you know, some people who buy these. Let me clarify. Some people who buy these who are not gamers, not experienced, they're just guys who think that gun is cool. <laughs> and they've been shooting factory Glocks. And then they go out for the first time and they're going to shoot their tactile sport. Uh, that makes me very nervous. <laughs> well, talk about the trigger. Like, if somebody hands you a gun, would I hand you a gun and say, hey, Tyler, look at how what the nice sight picture is on that. Like, no, hey, Tyler, check the trigger on this. Right? Isn't that what somebody says when they hand somebody a gun? Yeah. It's not like, hey, Ben, notice how well these grips fit my hand. Notice how clear the, the sight picture is. It's like, no, hey, Ben, check out how light this trigger is. And you're like, oh, wow, it's so light. Does it pop primers too? And you're like, yeah, sometimes. Oh, that's okay. It's really light. I like it. You know? Like, there is that. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Another, uh, another amazing podcast. Always appreciate doing them. Listeners, if you have a question you'd like the answer to, go to bensterker.com, send me your question, and uh, we would for sure be happy to talk about it. Yeah, right, guys? Ben can give you trigger job advice. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs>